Good evening to everyone out there in Bible study land. This is our ninth Bible lesson in this type of setting. I hope you have received a guidebook to help those of you who are not familiar with Bible study. That will excite you and cause you to want to learn more about God and his universe. I give honor to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost for allowing us to be together once again. During times like these, one can never know where one will end up. And we don't know how long these circumstances will last. But one thing is for sure, church, we are on a journey. I know that there are I know that there are many people all over the country now living in a strange world who are having a hard time staying inside their homes. Being with their companions, they're having a hard time being with their companions too. Being a teacher to their children, taking regular baths, getting others to take regular baths, washing hands frequently, wearing face masks, following one-way arrows in a grocery store. Boy, that's fun, isn't it? Keeping a six-foot distance from the nearest human being, along with many other tasks and chores that those at home with us are dictating to us and holding us accountable for. Sure, we don't want to follow any rules from anyone that holds a position of power or have an appearance of power over us. Don't you tell me that I need to brush my teeth. It doesn't matter how old we are. Be ye a child or an adult. Not one of us on this universe wants to be told what to do. We don't want our parents. We don't want our teachers. We don't want our employers, our governors, or our pastors, or anyone else to tell us anything about anything. Being in a stay-at-home stay posture, we are handicapped. We can no longer just get mad at someone, get up, slam the door, jump in the car, and go where we want to go. Why? Because everything out there is shut down. We are limited as to where we are allowed to take our temp temper tantrums. Our girlfriends and boyfriends are stuck at home with their husbands and wives. We can't see them either. There is nowhere to go in the house because every space in the house is common ground. So what do we end up doing? Exactly what the pastor said this past Sunday. We end up barking back and forth at one another. There are some people who have decided enough with this being at home with my loved ones with whom I have discovered that I can no longer try to get along with them. I give up. We are so ready to venture out there that it doesn't matter what the authorities are saying or what the numbers are saying. Why it doesn't even matter how many people are getting sick and leaving this world. All that matters is I am tired of being at home and I want to have it my way. And I don't care how it may affect you. I'm tired of being obedient and cautious and considerate. I want it my way. Isn't that what, um, what's his name? Oh my goodness, Frank Sinatra said that. I, I want it my way. All I can say about this all I can say about that is this. It would be nice if you just go on out there by yourself, stop trying to convince other people to follow you down the primrose path. Good luck with that. I have decided that I am going to wait on the Lord. Speaking of the Lord, tonight let us go down the path where the scriptures speak to us about another future event that will happen, or should I say has happened, as God introduces the future Jesus to the Jewish nations, Judah and Israel. 
as the coming of the Lord. He was a servant. That is what I want to become, a true, solid servant of God. In all of these instances, the term servant carries the idea of humble nobility. Being God's servant is an honorable position. Throughout the New Testament, the word bond servant or servant is applied to someone absolutely devoted to Jesus. Dr. Walt Larimore made this statement. In spite of his popularity, Christ never sought earthly power or position or prestige. Our Lord came into this world as a servant and Jesus remained committed first and foremost to offer himself as a servant. Dr. Charles Stanley says, if you and I are to make the impact in life upon others that we should, if we are to fulfill God's purpose and plan for our life, and if we are to reap the maximum blessings that God has prepared for us, we too must develop the spirit of a servant. And our actions must be the actions of a servant. A servant who realizes that Jesus is not only our savior, but he is the master of our life. Any unwillingness or resistance to serve others in his name is an act of rebellion. As believers, we should follow the example of Jesus, who was equal with God, but humbled himself and became a man. Here we are, hundreds of years before the birth of Christ, and God is introducing him to the Jews. He's introducing his son, Jesus, who is to become their savior and our savior. How many years between this proclamation and Jesus' birth? Let me tell you. It was still during Isaiah's time, which was approximately six year, 600 years before Christ was born. The people didn't accept him when he was born, but before we can get anywhere with God, we are going to have to recognize Jesus Christ as our Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Back during Isaiah's time, we had the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Jesus was born sometime in 4 BC, while the new creation of Israel as a nation was established on May 14, 1948, by a man called David Ben-Gurion, who was the head of the Jewish agency. U.S. President Harry S. Truman recognized the new nation on the same day. During that same year, there was the beginning of the Arab-Israeli War, which has been going on for the past 74 plus years. My thought for tonight, we would see Jesus. A lot of people don't know who Jesus is. And there's a lot of people that's not seeking to know who he is. John 12, 20 through 30 says, And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip. This bunch of Greeks, they came to Philip, which was of Beth Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Well, Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again, Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. In other words, I really don't have time to talk to anyone right now. I'm, I have a, a, a something that is very pressing, an appointment that I have to make, and it's very important. So he is telling Andrew and Philip, uh, I think you might need to tell those guys, the hours come that the Son of Man should be glorified. 
24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. That's a wonderful statement there. We all know uh, all about agriculture, and we know where corn comes from. We know where beans come from and okra. Uh, that seed has to go into the ground, and it has to die, and then it has to come back out of the ground, and the big stalk has to come up, and the fruit comes on it. But here's the point. If it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Verse 25, he that loveth life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. So let me read that one more time. If any man serve me, let him follow me. If you want to serve Jesus Christ, follow him. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. He says, now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this cause came I unto this hour. So sometimes we can't be saved from what we were meant to do. 28, he's praying. Jesus did not meet the Greeks at that time. Jesus went on to fulfill his appointment with God. In 28, his prayer was, Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people therefore that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, The voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Many times, Things happen and we experience them not because of the experience itself, but for our sakes. We've witnessed a lot of miracles. We've witnessed a lot of things in our lives. And these things that, that come before us, they are always there to help us. And that sometimes we need to hear his voice and know that we're not alone. I'm going into the chapters tonight, Isaiah 42, Christ, servant of Jehovah. That's the reason that I went through the word servant, because it's hard to understand uh, what it means to be a servant. Most people, when they think of servanthood, they think of I'm somebody's maid or I'm somebody's butler or I'm somebody's chauffeur or I'm a, a house cleaner, or I'm this, or I'm that, and I'm doing menial work. Being a servant at its highest capacity is the greatest honor that any of us could, could have. We, we always want to be served as human beings, but we need to understand that sometimes, more times than often, we really need to be the servant that God is looking for. Our job is to serve others, not ourselves. And sometimes we look for pleasure for ourselves rather than helping other people. Verse 1, we're going to talk about the prediction of Jesus Christ and his gospel coming to the Gentiles. This is our Pastor Chuck Smith's um, outline, and I wanted to really share this with you tonight because I think it's really good. In verses 2 to 4, he gave us some, some uh, extra uh, verses to read. Hebrews 2, 8 and 9 says, Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. 
For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. So I think what, what the Lord is trying to let us know here, or what God is trying to tell us, is that when Jesus came, all things were, were put under subjection to him. And I know people want to bypass Jesus, but that's not going to be possible in the last days that we're going to be going through. Number nine says, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. So I, I wondered about the statement, a little lower than the angels. The angels live in heaven with God. The angels are not um, flesh and blood. God sent his son down here in the form of flesh and blood in order to relate to us because we don't have any other method or mode of relation to someone unless we know that someone in the flesh went through the same things that we're going through. So that's where that little lower than the angel thought uh, came, came from and that explanation for me. Colossians 3.1 says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. I believe he's there now sitting on the right hand watching us and being with us. Verse 6 and 7, as, as we begin to read it, I want you to think about this. Jesus frees us from the power of sin. We were born in sin, shaped in iniquity. And those are things that we can't, we can't escape alone. We are prisoners of sin when we come into this world. We cannot control ourselves. We can't keep ourselves from doing things that we don't want to do. You remember Romans 7 uh, when Paul was saying, that that I want to do, I, I, I don't do it, and that that, I'm, that I don't want to do, I find myself doing it. He's, he's being um, led by his flesh, and it's very hard for him to reject what it is that his flesh wants. We talked last week about the flesh, man, the flesh, man, the body, and man, the soul, and how man really doesn't own anything. God gives us everything that we have, but we must take care in, ver uh, in verse 6 and 7, I'm sorry, Jesus frees us from this power of sin. When Jesus comes inside of us, we are free from the dominion that sin has over us. And we should live it to the fullest extent. If we bow down, if we are the servants of the Lord, if we follow his commandments, if we do what he tells us to do, if, if we don't do what he tells us not to do, if we obey him, then we are free from the power of sin. Sin has no more power over us. We are led by the blood of Jesus, and that's something that I want to continue to do for the rest of my life. Um, in verse 8, it says, We must take care that we do not seek to serve God to bring glory to ourselves. It's not important that I have a, a, a big name. It's not important that you give me uh, twenty thousand dollars to make a to 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 make a um a show up for a performance. It's not important for me to to uh, get you to make sure that everything is comfortable for me before I can do anything. If I have to go and do something that is not comfortable in an environment that is not comfortable, I should be willing to do that for Christ. Um, people should not have to cater to me. I should be able to serve people. That's what I'm here for. If I'm under the power of the Spirit of God, I am a servant of Christ, and I am here to serve the people. It's just like any politician. They come on board because they are telling us, I represent you, and I will speak for you, and I will listen to you, and I will do what you uh, 
what your desires are, if it's within the law, and I'll be a good servant of the people, by the people, for the people. And sometimes we forget that of the people, by the people, for the people. Right now, it's of Jesus, by him, and for him. I cannot, I cannot turn my back on serving the Lord. Verse 14 says, God has been patient with the earth for a long time. And that is the truth. We know we're entering into the last days. We know that time is running out. I may not be here when Jesus cracks the sky and comes back, but I can tell you for sure whether I'm here or not, he's coming back. And those that are here will definitely know that he is on his way back. Verse uh, 15 and 16, these are just the beginning notes. This is not the scriptures. We're getting into the scriptures in just a moment. But this is what uh, each scripture is talking about. Verses 15 and 16, the Lord will make the earth waste during the tribulation period. But then he will begin his restoring work. We know that this coronavirus has, um, in certain parts of the world, uh, taken the smog out of the air. People who were wearing masks way before corona took over, they were in the, in the smoke and the smog and everything. And I think Singapore, I was looking at that on TV the other night, and how the lady says, uh, you can look out the door, or Indy, I believe it was. She said, you can look out the door now and you can see the blue skies. It's so beautiful. But before, they could not see the mountains. They could not see the blue sky. And and we think right then, oh, we're, it's our job to make the earth beautiful again. It's, it's really our job to take care of Mother Earth. Okay, God brought earth here. God did that. Uh, Mother Earth didn't just pop up by herself, okay? Uh, the Lord formed the earth. The Lord formed the heavenly bodies. The Lord started all of creation. And we need to understand that. Uh, we didn't get here by ourselves. And things that are here did not get here by themselves either, okay? But when the Lord comes back during tribulation time, Earth, this earth, it's going to be gone. Smog, it, you, you're going to see so much smoke and fire that you, didn't, you don't even know. You have never seen the smoke and fire that will be on this earth when Jesus comes back to tear down this kingdom and build his kingdom. He will restore the earth. He will restore it. But he will be the king and he alone. Verse 19 through 20 uh, we have some backup scriptures. Mark 8, 18 says, Having eyes, see ye not? And having ears, hear ye not? And do ye not remember? All of you that are saved out there, don't you remember what your life was like before you were saved? I certainly do. And then John 1 and 11 says, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. We're going to talk about that a little bit tonight. Verses 21 to 25, the Jews were driven out of the land because of their reflect, rejection of the Messiah. Yet, they did not realize that that was the reason they were driven out of the land. See, God, God might not say much to us, but let me tell you, when he starts working on us, uh, he's got a good reason to work on us, okay? And uh, sometimes we, well, I'm sure if he's doing it, we all deserve whatever's happening to us. But the Lord is merciful. He loves us. Our job is to be good servants to the master. I know that doesn't sound too good, especially from certain group of people who were slaves back in the day. But this, we're, we're a slave with God in a different way. We are servants with him in a different way. It is so hard to be obedient to anyone who tries to tell us what to do. 
but I'm praying every day that I can be subject under some authority, wherever it's coming from. Lord, help me to be obedient. Lord, help me not to try to politicize myself and to glorify myself. I want to glorify the Lord. We're going to start with Isaiah 42 tonight. I'm going to try to get through 43 if I can. And, and I've told you the notes about 42 already. Verse 1. Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delighted. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. We are the Gentiles. And what you don't understand, or what I hope you understand when it's over tonight, Isaiah 42, okay? Jesus is coming on the scene in this scripture 700 years before Jesus is born. God is telling what is going to happen 700 years from now. But also, he's telling us, or, or the Jewish people at that time, he will bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Well, the Jews and the Gentiles didn't have anything to do with each other. You know the Samaritan story. You know all of those stories. So people have a habit of not mingling with each other. The, I, I talked about that several weeks ago. We all have the same color blood, so don't worry about that. But Jesus, God is making a pronouncement now that he has a servant that's going to come on the scene. He is delighted. His soul is delighted with him. He had put his spirit upon him. He's going to bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. That is a prophecy, and you got to understand this. That is a prophecy 700 years before Mary had a baby, okay? Now, when Mary had the baby, some of the apostles back then quoted Isaiah 41 to verify and validate the accuracy of the prophecy. So you can always go back in the scripture, look at the timeline of history, and you will see how accurate the prophecies are that God sent through his prophets, okay? Verse 2, here's what Jesus is not going to do. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. Now you know that. It says, a bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench, and he shall bring forth judgment unto truth. Now, Jesus is not coming here crying, and he's not coming here to lift himself up, and he's not coming here to make a name out, uh, for himself by crying out in the street. That was left up to John. You remember John the Baptist when he was out in the wilderness saying there was someone coming that's greater than he was? Now, he's going to be so gentle that a bruised reed, he won't even break it. You see, sometimes people see broken people and they do things that they can to break them even more into pieces than they already are. Uh, and the smoking flax he should not quench. If you see, uh, you, you know back in the um, uh, Boy Scout days and Girl Scout days, we used to take the wood and try to start the fire. And, and we called it uh, kindling, and you tried to get the kindling to start. Um, if, even if the, the kindling was smoking, Jesus will not try to quench it. So if whatever it is that you're doing, he'll not try to put his finger on it and mash it down so you can't get it done. He has a purpose for you in your life. And though the flame of success may not be bubbling around you, he certainly will not put out what 
is inside of you to make something out of yourself. He shall bring forth judgment. Now, if you're doing something that you have no business doing, oh, he's going he's gonna to reckon with you. Verse 4, he shall not fail nor be discouraged. Um, he went into the garden and he, he asked God if that was possible, could that pass from him? But then he changed his mind immediately. He said, nevertheless, you know, let thy will be done, God. Oh, I, I know what I'm going to have to go through, but I want you to have your glory tonight. Do what you need to do. Sometimes we go through something and we want out of it. This is That's why I made the statement in the beginning of the lesson tonight, because we're talking about we act like this is the worst possible thing that's ever happened to us in our lives. Coronavirus is bad. This is the worst thing that I've encountered in my 73 years. I've not seen things like this. I guess I'm 73. I might be 72. I don't know right now. But what I'm thinking about here is he shall not fail nor be discouraged till he hath set judgment in the earth and the owls shall wait for his law. That's the thing that we have a problem with, people. Back in Isaiah 40, I think it was, it said, they that wait upon the Lord, he will renew their strength. Did he not say that for us? Is that not what we should be doing? We should be waiting on him. We can't get out there and do things for ourselves. I told you sometimes um, I, I've, I've had flat tires. And I've called my husband and I said, I need to fix my flat tire. Sometime I would have had, I had to wait on him to come and fix it. Then he taught me independence in, in a, um, a kind of unusual way. I remember calling him one time and I told him the car wouldn't start. He said, what do you mean the car won't start? I said, the car won't start. He said, I don't know what that means. He said, it, uh, how is it going? Is it sputtering? Is it going, yeah, 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 yeah? What is it doing? I, you didn't ask me what it was doing. I just told you it wouldn't start. We took about 15 minutes just talking about the car won't start because I did not understand what he was talking about. He was talking about the mechanics of the thing. Sometimes we tell God things that we really don't know what we're talking about. We try to settle things ourselves, but but then if we just stop and listen, okay, what do you what do you mean? What do I mean the car won't start? That was a good question, wasn't it? He said, how does it sound? Well, I got a little more information out of that. I said, well, it's sounding like this. When I started, it goes click, click, click. Well, he could tell by the sound. I don't know what, what he was telling me back then, but he was so good at being a mechanic, he could tell me if the alternator was messed up or if it was the battery that was messed up or, or if it was the starter that was messed up. Thank you for helping me <laughs> because I did not know, but based on the sound of the car, he could tell what was wrong with the car. Well, that's an authority. You need to go to somebody. I, I didn't want to hang up and get mad and hang up and say, okay, don't worry about it. Forget it. Well, would my car have gotten any help had I done that? Wait on the Lord. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. Verse 4. He sh I, I said this before, but let me read it again. He shall not fail nor be discouraged till he have set judgment in the earth. Now, he's going to bring forth judgment unto truth. How do you measure truth? Somebody asked me the other day, what's the meaning of truth? And I'm trying to figure out what is truth. Truth is the opposite of untruth, right? So, whatever is your truth may not be my truth based on my environment and my knowledge of what I have experienced over my lifetime. So, what may be true for me, you might have a little additional information to that same fact that would give me greater truth than what I have with myself. So we should never reject 
what someone is trying to, to help us with. But God said, he shall not fail nor be discouraged till he hath set judgment in the earth, and the owls shall wait for his law. Verse 5, thus saith God, the Lord. Now listen to this. Thus saith God, the Lord. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He that created, now he's explaining who he is, okay? He that created the heavens and stretched them out. He that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it. Okay, he spread the earth. We have the earth. There were plants that came out of it. And he that giveth breath unto the people upon it. He provided the people with the air to breathe. Do you know, I remember when we didn't have to pay for air. But somebody thought if we, if we put it in a little tank, we can charge it. Because when people have flat tires, they can pay for the air that they put in the flat tire. The technology that it took to get that tube on the, the, the tire is where the cost came in. But God brought air to us. He giveth breath unto the people upon it, and the spirit to them that walk therein. So I don't care what you claim to have and what you say is yours and what you say you, you own. You don't own diddly. It all belongs to God. Verse 6, I, the Lord, have called thee into righteousness. We, we think sometimes we went around and we decided to choose the Lord. But it was the conviction of the Spirit that would cause you to follow and look for the Lord. So he calls us into righteousness. And will hold thine hand. And will keep thee. And give thee for a covenant of the people. For a light of the Gentiles. The Lord is going to do a lot of things for us to open the blind eyes to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house um i've been hearing a lot of talk about bringing people out of prison lately not too much progress on it but we're gonna keep praying but that's not the same prison that that this is talking about. It's talking about the prison that sin has, the power that sin has over us. Verse 8 says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Now here's what he's saying. Okay, people, you can set up your graven images. You can go around and call yourself Jesus Christ or Lord or whatever you want to call but I'm not giving my name to anybody else. You don't own it. I am the Lord. Verse 8, I am the Lord. That's a positive statement. There's no question mark behind it. I am the Lord. That is my name. And I heard some song somewhere, what's my name? The Lord is the Lord. And there's no other that can go by that name and claim that name. Neither can we look at graven images and call them our Lord. Verse 9, Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. So he tells us, but if we're not reading and if we're not studying, if we're not listening, Oh, he's been telling us ever since the beginning of time when he created the heavens and the earth. He told us everything we needed to know to survive in this sinful world. And before, he says, before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Oh, he can be talking, but if, if you're deaf and you can't hear, if you're blind and you can't see, uh, it's not going to help us much. Number 10 says, sing unto the Lord a new song and his praise from the end of the earth. Ye that go down to the sea and all that is therein, the isles and the inhabitants thereof. 
Verse 11, let the wilderness and the cities thereof lift up their voice. The villages that Kedar doth inhabit, let the inhabitants of the rock sing. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. Let them give glory unto the Lord and declare his praise in the islands. And I'm sure we've heard a lot of island praises to the Lord. But what I'm saying, saints, is we really need to lift up his voice. I don't need to tell you what my name is. You know, my name can be Charlemagne. It doesn't matter. My name can be any name, but there is no name on this earth greater than the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number 12, number 13, I'm sorry. The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. If you're in trouble, don't you worry. The Lord will go forth as a mighty man. He will stir up jealousy like a man of war. He will cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. And here's 14. Here's what he tells us. Listen to this. I have long time holding my peace. You think? Is God holding his peace? If I had the patience of God, oh, that would be really beautiful. Lord, help me hold my peace sometime. You know, sometimes uh, it just gets on you so bad, you just got to talk. You just got to say what you're thinking. It's not good always to say what you're thinking. He says, I have been still and refrained to myself. Now, here's what he's going to do. Hey, that's over with. He says, I'm going to cry like a travailing woman. I will devour and de I will destroy and devour at once. So, what you mean, Lord, you're going to cry like a travailing woman? We've been getting, getting the raw end of the deal for a long time. But he said, I have holden my peace for a long time. I'm not going to hold my peace no more. I'm coming down on you like a, like a crime, like a woman travailing. And you know what that means, travailing with child. He said, I will destroy and devour at once. 15, I will make waste mountains, hills, and dry up all their herbs. And I will make the rivers islands, and I will dry up the pools. He, When he comes through, you know how these hurricanes are. You know how the typhoons are. You know how the tsunamis are. When he comes through, you can't even blink your eye. And it's all done. There's nowhere to go. 16, and I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. I will lead them in the paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them. So I'm going to give the blind some sight and crooked things straight. I'll make the crooked things straight. Oh God, make the crooked things straight, okay? These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. Now here's number 17. They shall be turned back. They shall be greatly ashamed that trust in graven images, that say to the molded images, ye are our God. God got a problem with this. When you put something else in the place of God, God's got a problem. Would you see Jesus? Would you like to know who he is? Just read this sometime. He says, I am the Lord. He says here, hear ye deaf and look ye blind that ye may see. So what does it sound like? He looks like to me he's going to give the deaf uh, the ability to hear and he's going to give the blind the ability to see. Verse 19, who is blind but my servant or deaf as my messenger that I sent? Who is blind as he that is perfect? And blind as the Lord's servant, seeing many things, but thou observest not. You ever seen anybody like that? They see everything, but they don't 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 observe nothing. Uh, I was always told. I remember being being uh, in the Seven Eleven one time, and I was I was pregnant, and um, the robber had a big old forty five gun, 
That thing must have been about 12, 13 inches. I don't know how long it was, but it was big. He put it in my face and told me to hush and 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 do what he said do. And, and I, I, I was very quiet during that time. And and when you say the blind, you know, seeing many things, but thou observeth not. Opening the ears, but he hear not. I was the only one that could tell or give the police a description of who the robber was, what the robber had on, had a watch on. I told him he was left-handed because the gun was in his left hand. So everybody else was telling him he was the, that the guys were 30 and 40 years old. I said, no, 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 these guys were 20 and 25. They were under 25. We found them, and I was scared to death the rest of my life. Then we go in here, it says, on 21, the Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. Well, Lord have mercy. It's time for us to magnify the law and make it honorable. But this was 700 years before Jesus Christ was born that he's talking here. But by the same token, just as he said it then and was talking about something that was going to happen in the future, I'm holding on to this scripture and hoping that it's going to happen in the time that I'm living in today. 22, but this is a people robbed and spoiled. They are all of them snared in holes and they are hid in prison houses. They are for a prey and none delivereth for a spoil, and none saith restore. You hear anybody talking about restoring anything nowadays? You hear anything talk, anybody talking about taking from people, not delivering anything, hiding in houses? Who among you will give ear to this? Who will hearken and hear for the time to come? Who gave Jacob for a spoil and Israel to the robbers? You remember that? Did not the Lord, he against whom we have sinned? For they would not walk in his ways, neither were they obedient unto his law. Therefore he hath poured upon him the fury of his anger and the strength of battle, and it hath set him on fire round about. Yea, he knew not, and it burned him. Yea, he laid it not to heart. That's the end of chapter 42. We're going to go into 43 now. In 43, Israel is to be redeemed and restored. Verse 6, God predicts the regathering of the Jewish people to Israel. Do you remember in the preface tonight when I talked about Israel being made a nation in 1948? And I believe it was uh, Harry Truman who uh, record, uh, represented the United States as president and recognize the Jewish nation. Uh, at that time, there was a promise that there was going to be an Arab nation too, but that never came to fruition, which is why they are still fighting each other today. Verse 7, the word bara translated, created from the Hebrew, means something created out of nothing. Now, I know science tells us that uh, we came here with a big boom, uh, and there was a big old explosion out of nothing. Well, my, my question about that is, if there was an explosion then and, and there was nothing there, then I thought bombs explode. I, I, I don't know, but it seemed like to me there had to be something there in order for something to, to appear. So I would rather believe God's uh, version of the creation than to think about the, the other version based on the scientific facts, which are nothing. Here's the thing. God created science. Did y'all know that? Uh, we cannot separate science from God. God was the greatest scientist in the world. He created the heavens. All of those galaxies, all of those uh, constellations, all of the things that he did. Um, I told you about Sir Isaac Newton last week. The sun is the, just the right amount of distance 
from the earth, not to burn it to a crisp. Look it up. The sun is so hot. If it was an inch or two closer to the earth, we'd be roasted. Okay? Just put us on a barbecue pit somewhere. But God specifically set the sun and the earth in place, in position. The earth actually rotates on an axis and it's tilted, and it goes around slowly, for if it went around like a spinning top, we'd all be staggering on this earth. And sometimes if it lost its speed and got too fast, it would blow us off the earth. But that's not what happened. He created gravity to hold us down because there's something in the earth that's pulling us to earth, that's keeping us, right there in place. Uh, we need to think about these things. There's no conflict between science and God. God is the scientist. He is the chief scientist. And if the scientists learn anything about any of this stuff that's going on, that God is going to show it to them. Give them the ability to see it. But yet, there's no recognition from the scientists that God is helping them. But he is. He is. You know why? Because he made a commitment to us. He loves us and he wants to take care of us. And he's going to do it whether you give him any credit or not. But I give him credit and all the glory for all of the unknown answers that are out here in this universe that he is going to reveal to us. You see, we don't understand the, 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 the really mode of truth. Uh, it's easier to tell a lie than it is to tell the truth. But the only thing about a lie is, in my old age, if I told a lie, I'd have to remember what the truth was because I might tell another lie to cover that lie. And before you know it, you don't know which lie you told first time and you get all mixed up. And with, with our old minds, we can't categorize the lies that we tell. So we're better off just telling the truth. So if you ask me how you look in that dress, I just might tell you the truth because I don't want to lie to you about it, okay? I wouldn't want you to lie to me. If, if there was something that was wrong, if I had a split somewhere that needed to be sewn up, I would rather you tell me that than to tell me, oh, honey, you look nice. Don't tell me that. Tell me the truth. And whatever the truth is as far as you're concerned, uh, because everybody's truth is not the same. Even though the truth is truth, your truth may not be my truth. Okay? Verse 10 and 11. God is declaring that there is no other God but himself and no other gods to come. Verse 22, 24, Israel had not been keeping the covenant with God by sacrifice and offerings. Verse 25 to 28, because they have not kept his covenant, they experienced desolation. You know, God's not going to play with us. You don't do right and you fall in a pit, he'll just leave you. I remember someone asking me one time, why is it that God let bad things happen to us? Why is it? I told him just like this. I said, let me tell you something. I said, there are sand pits. I don't know if you all remember back in the day, but you could walk into something that uh, sinking sand. You, uh, I don't remember what that was called, but you would step in the sand, quicksand. You could step in quicksand, and the more you move, the farther down in the sand you got. I said, why God will let you fall into a, a, a pile of quicksand, and he'll watch you go down. And will not move a finger until you reach your hand up and ask him to pull you out of it. So no matter what kind of trouble you get yourself into, he's not going to help you until you decide to ask him to help you. Isaiah 43, we're going to start from that and I hope I can finish this pretty soon. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not. For I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. While he was talking here in Isaiah 43, the Israelites were in Babylon as prisoners. 
But yet he said, I have redeemed thee. So he was talking in the future to them. After a while, Nehemiah is going to come along, build a temple, and you all are going to walk out of that place and be okay. But I've called thee by my name, and you are mine. You're going to be mine no matter how bad you are, no matter how rough you are, no matter how things don't work with you. I'm going to love you no matter what you do. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. That's a great scripture. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. These are promises from God. Even though he was talking to Israel, he's talking to his children. He's talking to the people that are servants of him. He's talking to people that love him, that's trying to follow him, that wants to walk by him and be with him. He says, I don't care what kind of waters you pass through. I'm going to be right there with you. I don't care what kind of rivers. I, I, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you won't be burned. You know Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for my ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for thee. Since thou wast precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Therefore will I give men for thee and people for thy life. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. God is a faithful leader. He's a faithful provider. And what he says he will do, that he will do. No matter what kind of trouble you get yourself in, he will find a way for you to come out of it. Six, I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. And, and I want you to know something. He was talking about Cyrus now. This is a, that, that other um, king that he was talking about bringing out. He says, I'm going to say to the north, give him up. I'm going to say to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Even everyone that is called by my name. For I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. This is about Cyrus. Bring forth the blind people that have eyes and the deaf that have ears. Well, you know he talked in 42, he'd already healed them, right? The blind's going to see and the deaf's going to hear. He said in 9, let all the nations be gathered together and let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us the former things? Let them bring forth their witnesses and they, that they may be justified or let them hear and say it is truth. Truth means a lot to God. You cannot lie to God. I don't, you can lie to yourself. <laughs> you can say things to yourself. That, but they don't have to be the truth. But God sees all the way through you. It's called clean, clear through. You are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he before me. Listen to this. Before me, there was no God formed. Neither shall there be after me. There was no God formed before me and there will not be a God formed after me. So I'm it, people. I, even I, am the Lord and beside me there is no Savior. I have declared and have saved and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. God's not backing up on his word. He knows who he is. Do you know who you are? Can you tell people who you are with the definitiveness that God has just said? He knows who he is. There is none before him. There is none after him. You remember in uh, Revelation, he says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He was here in the beginning. He will be here in the end. 
There is no other. I don't care what you put on a pedestal or put on your pedestal. God is God. And he will always be God. And there will never be another God. You can call him what you want to, but he's God. Okay? Yea, before the day was I... <laughs> Yea, before the day was, I am he, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? Okay, I'm go I can work, and who's going to stop me? Thus saith the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sake, I have sent to Babylon. He's saying, it was necessary for me to let Nebuchadnezzar come by and clean up all the cities, grab all of you all, take you to take you to Babylon and let you stay there for your sake. You were not doing what you were supposed to be doing. If I put you in bondage, you're going to pray and talk to me a little bit. If I bring you in your house and quiet you down a little bit, maybe you'll talk to me. God wants our attention. We cannot keep going around pretending that God is not in the building. He is in the building and he wants to talk with us. For your sake, I have sent to Babylon. For your sake, people, I've sent you to your homes. I brought down all of their nobles and Chaldeans. There's not a politician out there in this universe that could prevent us from not having to come into our homes. Whose cry is in the ships? I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Thus saith the Lord, which maketh a way in the sea and a path in the mighty waters, which bringeth forth the chariot and horse, the army and the power, they shall lay, lie down together. They shall not rise. They are extinct. They are quenched as tow. I told them away. See, God is telling us he's going to bring forth the army and the power and all of that. People that are up on the pedestal now, they're not going to rise later. They're going to be extinct. They're going to be quenched. You remember he said he wouldn't quench the smoking flax, right? If that smoking flax is trying to get to Jesus, he's going to do everything he can to keep that flame burning. But if that smoking flax is going against God and, and allowing the devil to use him, God will quench it. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Why do we, we dwell on the past all the time? Why do we constantly say, you did this to me, you did that to me, you did that, and you did the other? And 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 it says we neither consider the things that are, you don't consider the good things that people did for you. You don't consider the good things that came your way to bring you to where you are now. We forget, we are so easy to forget the good things that God did for us. We're always crying pity. We're always sorry. We're always dejected. But God wants to let us know, I brought you here. I brought you through the waters. You did not, you were not over, overflown. You could have drowned in those waters. You could have, but I brought you through. I took you to Babylon. I needed to sit you down and talk to you a little bit. Yes, I did take you to Babylon. But because you were there, you, did you learn anything while you were down there? If you didn't learn anything, it didn't do you any good. So what is it that I'm going to have to allow to happen to you that will get you to understand I am the Lord? Oh, hallelujah. He says, behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall, not, shall ye not know it? He's talking to us, people. He's telling us, I'm going to do a new thing. No, we can't go back to where we came from. There is no use to. Whatever we did back then, we cannot do it now. We've got to move on. I cannot look back to my past. 
I must keep looking on my future. Though the years of my life tell me that I don't have or may not have much of a future left, but he tells me, act like you're living, do the best you can, and move forward. Don't let nothing stop you, because I will do a new thing in your life. It shall spring forth. Who would have thought that I'd be sitting here before you talking to you about the Bible? It's been nine weeks. Who would have thought that? Nobody would have thought that, but God saw fit to do a new thing here. He's working with all of us. So whatever new thing you can think of for God to do in your body, in your spirit, in your soul, you allow God to work in you. You don't need to let foul things come out of your mouth. You don't need to let your body participate in things that are not fruitful and are not a blessing to God. You need to allow him to talk to you and tell you the path that he wants you to go in. He says, shall ye know, not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. He's doing that for us. The beast of the field shall honor me, the dragons and owls, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen people. Be one of his chosen people because that's what he wants us to do, saints of God. 21 tells us, this people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. He's got a certain amount of people out here that's going to praise him no matter what. And in the day and time that we live in, we're going to have to lift him up, saints, because there's going to be an atmosphere that don't want us to say anything about God. But thou hast not called upon me, O Jacob, but thou hast been weary of me, O Israel. See, see, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, they were separated from each other. They did not appreciate each other, and they did not call on God. Only, only Jacob's branch is what God was pleased with. 23, thou hast not brought me the small cattle of thy burnt offerings, neither hast thou honored me with thy sacrifices. I have not caused thee to serve with an offering, neither wearied thee with incense. Thou hast brought me no sweet cane with money, neither hast thou filled me with the fat of thy sacrifices. What is it that lately that you as a servant have sacrificed for God? You're not sacrificing for God. You're sacrificing for yourself. If it pleases you, that's what you want. But it's not what it's all about. That's not the game. God wants us to make sacrifices for him. But thou hast made me to serve with thy sins. Do you understand what I'm saying? You're stepping across the line. You're what they call it, um, straddling the fence. And, and you want me to serve along with you. You're asking me to be your servant. God says, I'm not your servant. You're supposed to be my servant. But you're asking me to serve you. Oh, God, I'm straddling the fence and I can't get down. Help me out, Lord. Oh, God, I can't pay the rent. Help me out, Lord. God would fix the rent for you. If you loved him and if you were with him, he will provide for you. I've not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. Can't you understand? There are blessings in serving God. He says, but thou hast made me, I'm reading this again, to serve with thy sins. I'm supposed to save you from your sins, not with your sins, not in your sins. He says, thou hast wearied me with thine iniquities. You send for people, you just worried me with all the sins that you've committed. You're asking me to serve you while you are sinning. I'm not going to be that kind of God no more. I even I am he that blotteth out. Now listen to this. 25. I even I am he that blotteth out thy transgressions from mine own sake. He said, some of you had so many transgressions, I just had to blot them out. When Jesus died on the cross, I had to blot them out, and I will not remember your sins. 
Now, this is good. I will not remember what you did in the past. I have forgiven you for this. Put me in remembrance, 26 says. Let us plead together. Declare thou that thou mayest be justified. I really want to justify you. I want to forgive you. I want to blot out your transgressions. I want to save you from your sins. But you take the lead in this endeavor. Thy first father hath sinned. I guess we're talking about Adam. And thy teachers have transgressed against me. Therefore, I have profaned the princes of the sanctuary and have given Jacob to the curse and Israel to the reproaches. So this is what happened. I let them all go to Babylon. I let them all become prisoners. You know why? Because I'm cursing Jacob and I'm, I'm, <coughs> I'm denouncing all the reproaches of Israel. Come to Jesus, people. We need to serve him. I didn't mean to fuss tonight, but it got on my spirit there. We need to get serious about the Lord. He came to save us from our sins. And Isaiah 42 and 43, you need to sit down and read it. He said, when you go through the water, I'm not going to, I'm not going to let you get drowned. I'm going to let you pass through some things. God bless you tonight. I love you with all my heart. Don't know where we're going to be next week, but I pray that you will take these lessons that we've talked about, do some research on it. I told you about Sir Isaac Newton last week. I ordered the book. I'm really fascinated about it. I want to be like a sponge and soak up everything God has for me to learn. As long as this old brain will work, I really want him to saturate it with his word. May God bless you tonight. Dear Lord, we come before you in the name of Jesus, asking you to bless everyone in the, within the sound of my voice. Help us, Lord, that we will become the true Christians that you want us to be. Lord Jesus, help us to understand that you are God and God alone. There is no other God. You are the mighty one. We are not the mighty ones. Help us, Lord. To remember where we are. You told us last week we were like grasshoppers in grass. You told us, Lord, how big you were. And God, I pray that you will help us to cling to Jesus like we've never done before. Help us, Lord, to understand the magnitude of what it is that you are trying to do to help us walk out of this wilderness that we are living in. In your holy and righteous name. Remember those that are sick, Lord Jesus. We've had some members that are in the hospital. Lord, we ask you to touch them and heal them. Help them to walk out of the hospital, Lord. Give them your favor, Jesus. Lord, we pray in your holy name. Amen. God bless you is my prayer. Thank you for being with us tonight.